Y'all, this is Jeremiah McPherson, Hallelujah Johnson, right back at y'all. We just recorded another leg day today. We got some lunges done today. It felt good to change it up a little bit, try to add a little bit more variety to it. But we got 1,825 days of simple discipline, 1,825 days of studying, 1,825 days of building myself, teaching myself how to think, 1,825 days of boxing, 1,825 days of doing porn, 1,825 days of reading and listening to audiobooks, 1,825 days of working out, 1,825 days of journaling, 1,825 days of tracking my calories, 1,825 days of recording content, 1,825 days of sticking to my values, 1,825 days of keeping it pimping, 1,825 days of staying so icy on these bitches, 1,825 days of going to work, 1,825 days of consistently working, 1,825 days of Mungo mentality, 1,825 days of working on my strategy. <clears throat> we got a few things that I'm grateful for. I'm grateful um, I have another porn to do today. I'm grateful to have so much to work on. I'm grateful. Uh, I know it's not, uh, there's not nobody more important than me. Plan 5150, I'm only concerned about my responsibilities. With that being said, fuck Puffy, fuck Dr. Dre, fuck Jay-Z, fuck Beyonce, fuck Kanye West, fuck Tiger, fuck Sauce Walker, fuck Kim Kardashian, fuck The Game, fuck Wes Watson, fuck Eric Thompson, fuck Floyd Mayweather, fuck 50 Cent, fuck C.T. Fletcher, fuck The Hawk, fuck Rihanna, fuck Anthony Gallo, fuck Paul Xavier, fuck The White Boy Neighbors, Two Bitches, fuck Kali Muscle, and fuck Jocko. We're going to get into a few quotes today, and then we're going to call it a wrap. Uh, let's see if we can find a few quotes real quick. I should have set a few to the side. Let me see. Um, cruelty springs from weakness. That's Seneca. And signs of intelligence is awareness of one's own ignorance. Nikhil Machiavelli. And let's find another one. Uh, I found freedom, losing all hope was freedom. Fight Club. Let's see. On a, on a long enough timeline, the survival rate for everyone drops to zero. Fight Club. I'm going to stop that right here. Um, this is Jeremiah McPherson. Hallelujah Johnson. This was another motherfucking leg day, and I love to put this work in. I'm right back at y'all. They get behind the door, they talk a different language. And I think that they do the white man more harm and do America more harm than the Muslims do who let the white man know exactly what we think and what black people think in general. Is there any leadership in the Negro community outside that of the black Muslim movement which you would approve of? Whoever is standing up telling the white man that his position is unjust and that uh, the black people should not have to wait for any Supreme Court, Congress, or Senate to legislate or even the president to issue any kind of a, of a, a proclamation to better the condition of our people. If a, if, he, if, a, if a Negro leader is standing up making that point clear, then he's all right with us. But as long as he's making the white man think that our people are satisfied to sit in his house and wait for him to correct these conditions, he is, he is misrepresenting the thinking of the black masses and he's doing the white man a disservice because he's making the white man be more complacent than he would be if he knew the dangerous situation that's building up right inside his own house. Uh, a cat is inside of your house. That, uh, that which exists in Atlanta. Now here it would seem to me would be an ideal uh, illustration of your point. In Atlanta are some of the wealthiest Negroes in the United States. They own insurance companies, banks, beautiful homes. They have their own restaurants, uh, nightclubs. They have some of the best schools that are all Negro schools. But do you really think that this makes them any better off? Do you think that this gives them any more dignity? Do you, I mean, isn't this, isn't this the goal towards which you're reaching? Uh, yes, this is the goal, the goal in part. But not only do we want our own community, we want our own land, period. Same as the Jews were uh, uh, never satisfied until they had Israel. They wanted a country that they could point toward and a flag that they could point toward. This doesn't mean that they even went to Israel, but this this uh, gave them prestige, it gave them dignity, it gave them something to back them up. And the black man in America's position is parallel with that of the Jews, especially when the Jews were in bondage under Pharaoh. And at no time did Moses in the Bible ever try and integrate the Hebrews into the Egyptian society. 
or accept any uh, hypocritical offers made by the slave master of that day. Uh, they, they, Moses taught complete separation and a land of their own flowing with milk and honey. He didn't teach them anything about any heaven up in the sky, but the only thing that would solve their problem is a land of their own. And the black man in America is the same as the Jews were in bondage under Pharaoh. We are strangers in a land that is not ours. We are rejected by this type of modern Pharaoh or Pharaonic society. And uh, the only way that we're going to solve our problem is to do the same thing today that the Hebrews violence. Can you tell, can you accuse me if a man is putting a rope around my neck of being violent? When I uh, violently struggle against this lynching to try and keep him from putting a rope around my innocent neck? Why, you'd be insane to cause me, call me violent, but this is what you're doing. This is what the white person in America is doing when the Muslim says that the black man should defend himself. No, it's the white man who is the one who is being violent. And the government is responsible for the violence as long as they don't stop it. And if we have to get violent to protect ourselves, then it's the government that should be charged with the crime because we're only upholding a law that they've been unable to uphold. Well, I take it you would approve of the tactics of Robert Williams, the Southern NAACP leader, um, who I think he was from the North or South Carolina. North Carolina, yeah. Uh, I don't know too much. I don't know too much about his tactics, but if he was trying to defend himself, he was within his God-given rights, and within, and he was also within his natural rights because the first law of nature is self-preservation. And and Martin Luther King has made the Negro in America unnatural. He has taken away from the Negro his God-given right to defend himself. He has not has them, has them going through. I, I looked on the television the other night and saw them beating a Negro unmercifully in Mississippi. And this, and this is the this is the result of a brainwashing technique that the uh, slave. You don't like to be told that, but what else are you? You are ex-slave. You didn't come here on the Mayflower. <laughs> you came here in a slave ship, in chains, like a horse or a cow or a chicken. And you were brought here by the people who came here on the Mayflower. You were brought here by the so-called pilgrims or founding fathers. They were the ones who brought you here. We have a common enemy. We have this in common. We have a common oppressor, a common exploiter, and a common di discriminator. So once we all realize that we have a, this common enemy, then we unite on the basis of what we have in common. And what we have foremost in common is that enemy, the white man. He's an enemy to all of us. I know some of you all think that some of them are enemies. Time will tell. In Bandung, back in, I think, 1954, was the first unity meeting in centuries of black people. And once you study what happened at the Bandung Conference and the results of the Bandung Conference, it actually serves as a model for the same procedure you and I can use to get our problems solved. At Bandung, all the nations came together. There were dark nations from Africa and Asia. Some of them were Buddhists. Some of them were Muslim. Some of them were Christian. Some of them were Confucian, Confucianists. Some were atheists. Despite their religious differences, they came together. Some were communists. Some were socialists. Some were capitalists. Despite, despite their economic and political differences, they came together. All of them were black, brown, red, or yellow. The number one thing that was not allowed to attend the Bandung Conference was the white man. He couldn't come. Once they excluded the white man, they found that they could get together. Once they kept him out, everybody else settled it at home. You get in the closet, argue it out behind closed doors, and then when you come out on the street, you pose a common front, a united front. And this is what we need to do in the community and in the city and in the state. We need to stop airing our differences in front of the white man. Put the white man out of our meeting, number one, and then sit down and talk shop with each other. I would like to make a few comments concerning the difference between the black revolution and the Negro Revolution. There's a difference. Are they both the same? And if they're not, what is the difference? What is the difference between a black revolution and a Negro Revolution?
us what is a revolution. Sometimes I'm inclined to believe that many of our people are using this word revolution loosely without taking careful consideration what this word actually means and what its historic characteristics are. When you study the historic nature of revolutions, the motive of a revolution, the objective of a revolution, and the result of a revolution, and the methods used in a revolution, you may change words. You may devise another program. You may change your goal and you may change your mind. Look at the American Revolution in 1776. That revolution was for what? For land. How was it, why did they want land? Independence. How was it carried out? Bloodshed. Number one, it was based on land. The basis of independence. And the only way they could get it was bloodshed. The French Revolution, what was it based on? The land lands against the land law. What was it for? Land revolution. They wanted land. They threw the British out, along with the Uncle Tom the Chinese. Yeah, they did. They set a good example. When I was in prison, I read an article in, don't be shocked when I say I was in prison, you're still in prison. <laughs> That's what America means, prison. When I was in prison, I read an article in Life Magazine showing a little Chinese girl, nine years old. Her father was on his hands and knees and she was pulling the trigger because he was an Uncle Tom in China. When they had the revolution over there, they took a whole generation of Uncle Tom, just wiped them out. And within 10 years, that little girl became a full-grown woman. No more Toms in China. And today, today is one of the toughest, roughest, most feared countries on this earth, by the white man, because there are no Uncle Toms over there. Of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward all research. And when you see that you've got problems, all you have to do is examine the historic method used all over the world by others who had problems similar to yours. And once you see how they got theirs straight, then you know how you can get yours straight. Please. There's been a revolution, a black revolution, going on in Africa in Kenya. The Mau Mau were revolutionaries. They were the ones who made the word Uhuru. They were the ones who brought it to the fore. The Mau Mau, they were revolutionaries. They believed in scorched earth. They knocked everything aside that got in their path. And their revolution also was based on land, a desire for land. In Algeria, the northern part of Africa, a revolution took place. The Algerians were revolutionaries. They wanted land. France offered to let them be integrated into France. They told the France to hell with France. They wanted some land, not some France. <laughs> and they... Who ever heard of a revolution where they lock arms, as Reverend Cleek was pointing out beautifully, singing, we shall overcome. <laughs> Just tell me, you don't do that in a revolution. You don't do any singing, you're too busy swinging. <laughs> it's based on land. A revolutionary wants land so he can set up his own nation, an independent nation. These Negroes aren't asking for no nation. They're trying to crawl back on the plantation. When you want a nation, that's 
is called nationalism. When the, black, when the white man became involved in a revolution in this country against England, what was it? They lived in the house with masks. They dressed pretty good. They ate good because they ate his food because he left. <laughs> they lived in the attic or the basement, but still they lived near their master. And they loved their master more than the master loved himself. They would, they would give their life to save their master's house quicker than the master would. The house Negro, if the master said, we got a good house here, the house Negro said, yeah, we got a good house here. Whenever the master said we, he said we. That's how you can tell a house Negro. If the master's, if the master's house caught on fire, the house Negro would fight harder to put the blaze out than the master would. If the master got sick, the house Negro would say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. We sick. <laughs> he identified himself for a wind, for a breeze. When the master got sick, the field Negro prayed that he died. If someone come to the field Negro and said, let's separate, let's run. He didn't say, where are we going? He said, any place is better than here. You got field Negroes in America today. I'm a field Negro. The masses are the field Negroes. When they see this man's house on fire, you don't hear these little Negroes talking about our government is in trouble. They say the government is in trouble. <laughs> Imagine a Negro. Our government. I even heard one say our astronauts. <laughs> they won't even let him near the plant. And our astronauts. Nothing in our book, the Quran, as you call it, Quran, teaches us to suffer peacefully. Our religion teaches us to be intelligent, be peaceful, be courteous, obey the law, respect everyone. But if someone puts his hand on you, send him to the cemetery. That's a good religion. In fact, that's that old time religion. That's the one that Ma and Pa used to talk about. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and a head for a head, and a life for a life. That's a good religion. And then anybody, no one resents that kind of religion being taught but a wolf who intends to make form the elected uh, uh, Whitney Young as the chairman. And who do you think became the co-chairman? Stephen Currier, the white man. A millionaire. Powell was talking about it down at the Cobo today. This is what he was talking about. Powell knows it happened. Randolph knows it happened. Wilkins knows it happened. King knows it happened. Every one of that so-called big six, they know what happened. Once they formed it, with the white man over it, he promised them and gave them $800,000 to split up between the big six and told them that after the march was over, they'd give them 700000 more. A million and a half invited a priest, a, uh, a rabbi, and an old white preacher. Yes, an old white preacher. The same white element that put Kennedy in power. Labor, the Catholics, the Jews, and liberal Protestants. Clean click that put Kennedy in power joined the March on Washington. It's just like when you got some coffee that's too black. You wrong, you bring me Martin Luther King and A. Philip Randolph and James Farmer and uh, those other three and see if they'll deny it over the microphone. No, it was a sellout. 
It was a takeover. When James Baldwin came in from Paris, they wouldn't let him talk because they couldn't make him go by the script. Bert Lancaster, what this beast that Baldwin was supposed to make, they wouldn't let Baldwin get up there because they know Baldwin was liable to say anything. They controlled it so tight, they told those Negroes what time to hit town. How to come?